Welcome to the program, Old Testament Prophets, with Father Mitch Paqua. Shalom, shalom, shalom. The peace of God be with you all. I'm Father Mitchell Packwell. I'm a Jesuit priest teaching up at Loyola University in Chicago. And we're going through the prophet Isaiah in his fourth and final stage of his career. I'd like you to open up to chapter 32 of the prophet Isaiah. Now this comes after a number of prophecies by Isaiah about all kinds of woes to the people who trust in Egypt and Babylon but don't trust in Yahweh and also oracles of salvation that if you trust in the Lord He'll take care of you. Now He's going to give to the women of Jerusalem an oracle. He's given the others to the leading men of the community. Now He's going to speak to the women not unlike Amos had done when he said in chapter 4, you fat cows of Bashan, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Well, Isaiah has something to say to the women. Uh, as a matter of fact, just like he did in his earlier stages of his career, back in chapter 3 and so on. So look up in um, chapter 32, verse 9 to 14. We see a prophecy of warning to the women of Jerusalem. It says, all right, ladies, get up, get up. You that are at ease, you're sort of sitting in the easy chairs and got everything going really nice before. Up, ladies, let's go and listen to my voice. You confident daughters, give ear to my speech. Pay attention. So this verse 9 is a summons to all these women, rich women especially. Because after a year and a few days, you shall be troubled, you confident women, for the vintage, that is the, the grapes, will fail and the gathering in the harvest will not work it's not going to come so that this is probably being spoken at some great festival like the New Year festival which celebrated the bringing in of the harvest in the autumn and he's saying next year ladies you have all, this year you have all kinds of stuff to buy and you're at ease because you have lots of wine lots of food but next year ladies you're not going to have it there's going to be empty shelves in your supermarkets. And you're not going to have anything good to buy or to eat or to drink. So tremble, you women that are at ease. Be troubled, you confident ones. Make your, strip yourself and make yourself bare. And put sackcloth on your loins. Now, what's he talking about there? You know, it sounds like he's some sort, sort of peeping Tom that wants the women to take off all the clothes or something, right? Well, not quite. It was a sign of mourning and grief to take the top of your clothes, the top of your dress, and show your breasts and then beat on them and scratch them. And they would do that when they were mourning the dead. And he's saying, you women are at ease now and that's what you're going to do because your children will starve, die of starvation. And you have to put, um, as he says here, sackcloth on your loins. That is, you have to wear burlap underwear, ladies. No more silk and stuff like that for you, uh-uh. No more negligees, but now you're going to have to wear burlap underwear. So smite, smiting your breast because of the pleasant fields and the fruitful vine. Now, in other words, you're going to be scratching and pounding on their bare breasts because the land will no longer be fertile. And that makes sense that he would ask the women to do that because women would be the ones who take care of cooking the food and preparing it for the families. And now they will mourn because the land will not bring forth food for the families. For the land of my people shall have briars and thorns and all the houses of joy in the joyous city. The palace shall be forsaken. 
The city shall be des d deserted. The mound and the tower shall be dens forever. And, the, and they shall, the city itself shall become a place that makes wild asses happy. And it shall be a pasture for flocks. In other words, that the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And that the wild asses and the sheep are going to come and just walk all over the place because people won't be there. And instead of houses, there'll just be places for the animals to eat and feed because the city will be deserted. So he's telling the women, mourn now and change your lives. Okay? But then he goes on to give a change because he says in verse 15 to 20 that there will be a change. That do this, mourn, be on your breast, scratch them and then show signs of mourning in verse 15 until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. Now that is the Spirit of the Lord because this Spirit of the Lord is what recreates the earth. Think back to Psalm 104 where the Lord says you take back your Spirit and everything dies. But when you give your Spirit you renew the face of the earth. So send forth your Spirit and renew the face of the earth. So when the Spirit of the Lord comes back then they will be able to stop mourning. And then when that happens, when the Spirit of the Lord comes, the, world, the desert shall become a fruitful field. That God's Spirit will come over this chaotic desert and His Spirit will make it into something fruitful with lots of vegetables and things growing there. But not, and, and the fruitful field will become a forest, an orchard. So what used to be a good field will become even better. Not just wheat, but trees of olives and fruit and all the good stuff that you love. But verse 16 says, not only will nature be changed, but people will be changed. Because that's the real activity of the Holy Spirit. Not just to change nature and renew the face of the earth as some sort of physical thing with plants, so that's good and important. But also people will be changed. For it says here, then justice shall live, shall dwell in the desert. And righteousness shall live in the fruitful field. That when you have this food, then you will live righteously and in a goodly and godly way and you'll be generous with it. Instead of being fat women at ease who take everything in for themselves and enjoy your own life and the heck with the poor, instead, righteousness will live in these new fields and you'll give food away to the poor and you'll help the needy. That's what the Lord wants from you. That kind of justice and righteousness. And the work of righteousness will be peace. That's what will happen. If you are righteous with all the bounty God gives you, if you give it away to the poor, then you have peace. And the effect of righteousness will be quiet and confidence forever. You'll be able to be at peace and quietude and enjoy a life of peace and quiet. And my people shall live in a peaceful place and in secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. And... It shall hail on the forest, but the city shall go into a valley. Now, what do you mean there? That the Assyrians will have punishment. The Assyrian enemies will have hail come down on them to punish them. But the city of Jerusalem shall be safe. Happy are you who sow beside all waters, and you will send forth the feet of the ox and the ass freely. In other words, you'll be so well taken care of, so much water, so much fertility, the ox and the ass will have plenty to eat. So trust in that salvation from God that is full of His Spirit changing nature and His Spirit changing hearts so that we take the good things of nature, the good fruits of the earth, and share it generously and then we don't have to worry about any kind of problems. We're taking a look at Isaiah and we're going to chapter 33. Now chapter 33 is one long section with little parts in it but it's basically one long section and so we're going to try and get through that whole chapter today it's not a collection of small oracles all put together it's rather one long oracle of salvation that's its basic message the whole chapter 33 salvation but it's salvation in response to the people of Jerusalem lamenting their situation now, what that means is this. 
Probably by this time, the Assyrian army is already surrounding Jerusalem. And this was a very dangerous situation as we're going to talk in the next couple weeks. Because the Assyrians took 46 cities of Jerusalem and captured over 200,000 people. So the people are experiencing lament and sadness and grief. So Isaiah speaks to that situation. It starts off in chapter 33, verse 1, with a woe. Hoy, shrothed, woe to the spoiler, and you were not spoiled. And you, the one who deals treacherously, and they did not have, they were not dealt with treacherously. When you have ceased to spoil other people, that is to take all their stuff, like they had done, took all the cattle and, like I said, 200,000 folks. When you are ceased with that, and when you're weary re dealing treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with you. Alright, so now he's talking to the people of Assyria. Now, earlier on in the other chapters, the woes were all directed against Judah. Now, Isaiah directs this woe against Assyria. And it's woe to you Assyrians for all the bad stuff you've done. You have been a trickster. You have been spoiling everybody. And now, when you're done, it's your turn next, buddy. And then verse 2 changes this where Isaiah now speaks to the Lord and gives a prayer to the Lord. After prophesying what would happen to Assyria, he goes to the Lord and says, Okay, now Lord, let's see if this, this can happen. Let's make you do what I just said is going to happen. He says, O oh Yahweh, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Let you know, be their arm every morning and our salvation in a time of trouble. In other words, he's, he's praying, Lord, show your favor to us over against the Assyrians. We wait for you. And this kind of prayer and request is, again, something that comes out of the whole tradition of Psalms of Lament. And that's what he's doing. And he said, be our arm. The arm is something that's strong. And it's something that, especially if you work out with weights and all that stuff, and I'm sure Yahweh has to balance the whole universe, that keeps him in good shape so it doesn't get flabby. You shouldn't get flabby either. We all need to work out a bit. Anyway, he's their arm, their arm of strength in our salvation in time of trouble. And then, in verse 3, again, he's speaking to Yahweh. At the noise of the tumult, at the noise of this, this commotion, the peoples have fled away. And at the lifting up of yourself, when you lift yourself up, the nations are scattered. In other words, Yahweh, we believe, we have an act of faith, that when you start to show your stuff, when you, you know, make all this commotion and noise, the enemy is going to flee. And as a matter of fact, uh, according to what we see in the Bible, in Isaiah, and also in the uh, second book of Kings, and what we also hear from the Greek historian Herodotus, all of a sudden, the Assyrians did run away. As soon as the Lord sent a plague, probably bubonic plague, among all these Assyrian armies, they all ran away all of a sudden. They never took the city of Jerusalem, just like Isaiah said. So that when the Lord rose up, the enemy was scattered. And then in verse 4, he describes the salvation that the Lord is going to bring says, your spoil is gathered like a, like a caterpillar gathers. As locusts leap, do they leap upon it. In other words, that your spoil, Assyria, is going to be taken away by the people of Jerusalem. The Assyrians will run away so quickly that the people of Jerusalem will be able to take it all. And just, they'll sort of make for themselves a cocoon out of all the spoils the way a caterpillar does. And the people of Jerusalem will jump onto all the spoil and just hop all over it like locusts. Hop upon it and just devour it up. And then, in verse 5, he gives a prophecy of salvation. And he, and he proclaims, Niskav Yahweh, Shochei Marom. Yahweh is exalted, who, for He dwells on high. And He fills Zion with justice and righteousness. 
Because for Isaiah, the victory in a battle is not enough to be called true salvation. True salvation for the prophet Isaiah means righteousness and justice. We have to accept that too. You know, even if we, Americans, defeated all of our enemies and got rid of them all, that would be nothing. That would be diddly do be useless if we do not act righteously and if we do not act justly. Because that's the kind of salvation God wants to change. Sure, our, the situation with our enemies, but more importantly, the Lord wants to change our actions, our hearts, to be righteous and just. And then in verse 6, he gives a bit of wisdom. And the stability of your time shall be a hoard of salvation, wisdom and knowledge and fear of Yahweh, which is his treasure. In other words, the wisdom of Isaiah is that the true, the true treasure that you will get, O Jerusalem, is not all the spoils left by the Assyrians, but you will get instead wisdom and knowledge and fear of Yahweh. That's your treasure. And that must be your treasure, and that must be mine. We're taking a look at Isaiah 33, one long oracle of salvation that comes in the midst of lament, in the lament of the people. And we see that lament mentioned here in verses 7 through 9. And here he describes the problems that the people see around them. Behold, there are lions or they're, they're valiant ones. It's not exactly sure what this word means, because it's like the word Ariel, the people of Jerusalem. We're not sure exactly, but somehow it means they're strong ones. They cry, they scream outside, and the ambassadors of peace weep bitterly. So, in other words, their armies didn't work, their politics didn't work, international politics, that didn't work. And so they're all crying and, and weeping and crying out. And then in verse 8, the situation isn't so good around the countryside. The highways, the roads are all destroyed, the laid waste. And the people who walk around, who travel, stop. You can't travel, and it's too dangerous to travel. Okay? And the, the, he's broken covenants, and they, they hated cities, and they don't care about people. In other words, the Assyrians are conquering cities and villages, and they don't care. They don't care, it's a mess. They're just trashing the whole country. Okay? Verse 9, The land mourns and it's grieving. The land itself, the earth is mourning and weeping. That means that nobody is taking care of the fields, nobody is watering them, so everything is wilting and dying. Lebanon is ashamed and it withers. And Sharon is like a, like a desert. And Bashan and Carmel are laid clean bare. Now, what does that mean? The great fertile mountainous areas are also languishing because Assyrians are everywhere. Lebanon is way up in the far north. Well, we know what Lebanon is. Sharon is a desert. Sharon is a section along the northern coast of Israel. And Bashan is over on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, what we now call the Golan Heights area. And then Carmel is a mountain over by the city of Haifa, where there used to be lots of vines. So the people say, look, God, you promised help. You say there'll be righteousness and all this good stuff, but what a mess. The place is a dump, because all these Assyrians are ruining the place. It's awful. So in verses 10 to 13, Yahweh speaks. And He says, Ata akum, now will I arise, says Yahweh. Ata Eromam. Now will I be exalted. Ata Enase. Now will I lift myself up. Now I'm going to act. Now I'm going to, re I'm going to lift myself up. Now I'm going to scare those people. And he says to the people of Assyria, to whom he addressed in the first woe, you conceive chaff and you bring forth stubble. Well, in other words, it, they, he compares the whole nation of Assyria to a woman giving birth. But what they conceive is just the chaff that flows off the wheat. And you, and you bring forth stubble, the, the little stumps off of the wheat stalks. 
Your, fire, your breath is a fire that shall devour you. Now, if they are bringing forth chaff and stubble, which burns very quickly, but their mouth is full of fire, that is, they're all sorts of full of war and violence and destruction, then that same fire they breathe out will destroy themselves because they're making themselves into chaff before God. And the people shall be like burning of, of, of lime, you know, just burning things down to the bones. And like thorns cut down that burn in the fire. Here, listen, all you who are far away what I have done. And you who are near acknowledge my might. In other words, the Lord is saying to all these foreigners, I will see to it that you are burned up completely. So pay attention and stop doing what you're doing or else you will be burned up by me. And then, verses 14 to 16 turn away from the Assyrians back to the dwellers of Jerusalem. And we see some questions where it says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Because the sinners outside Zion, that is the Assyrians who have surrounded the city, are afraid. And the sinners inside Zion ought to be afraid. Trembling have seized those who are, un, who are um, committing all sorts of profanation against God. They're, they don't like God. And therefore there's a question. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? In other words, who can stand to be in hell? Who can take it? That's the question put to sinners in Zion and those who blaspheme God. The answer is, who can stand it? You see a little bit of Torah, a little bit of, of, of teaching about righteousness by the prophet. And he says, like you see in Psalm 15, he says, the one that walks righteously, not just thinks about it, but walks in the path of righteousness with his whole life pattern, and who speaks rightly, speaks straightly. The one who despises what you get from oppression, and who shakes his hands from holding bribes. I want nothing to do with bribes. Just like Thomas More in the, in St. Thomas More in the movie A Man for All Seasons took a, a bribe and threw it away, dropped it in the water. The one who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil. The ones who don't go to violent, filthy, smutty movies and don't look upon evil and say, oh, that's not so bad, it's entertainment. Baloney. Such a person will be able to stand through the fire. He shall dwell on high, and his place shall be his, of defense shall be in the rocks, and his bread shall be given, and his water shall be sure. That if you are righteous in Jerusalem, the Lord will take care of you. The sinners will have to be worried, but not Yahweh. And then in verse 17 and 18, and, uh, and following 17 and 19, he describes the salvation. Then your eyes shall see the king in his beauty. King Yahweh, and also the Messiah. And they shall behold the land stretching out far away. And their hearts shall think about the terror. And they'll think back, where's the guy that thought he was so much, he's so heavy? Where's the one that counted our towers? You shall not see the fierce people anymore. You won't see these Assyrians who counted all your defenses. The people of deep speech that you couldn't understand, they talked this other language, you didn't know it. And he said, Instead, look upon Zion, verse 20 to 21. We've talked about his confidence and more of this salvation. Look upon Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes shall see Jerusalem as a peaceful dwelling place, a tent that shall not be removed, and its tent stakes shall never be plucked up. Neither shall the cords of the tent that hold the tent up, they won't be broken. But Yahweh shall be with us in majesty, in a place of broad rivers and streams, where no galley shall go with oars, and no big ship shall pass by. In other words, there will be lots of water for Jerusalem, which is this tent, but the ships of the enemies can't get to it. It will be safe. Why will this be? Why will we have salvation? For one reason only. For Yahweh is our judge. Yahweh is our king. He will save us. That's what will have salvation. So the ships won't be able to do anything against them. And even the lame people will be able to take prey from the enemies. And the people who live in Jerusalem will not say, I'm sick. 
and they'll be all forgiven of their sins. Because the Lord gives them salvation, He gives it to you and to me as well. God bless you.